Welcome to Your Exceptional Purpose Astrology Podcast. I'm Kerry Redgate. If you managed to catch the first episode, I hope it gave you a nudge to see your life from a slightly different vantage point. And I hope you found that beautiful little video in the show notes on my podcast website stunning aerial drone footage of the Borobudur Mandala Temple in Java, and you can see the mandala pattern quite clearly um, from above. So check that out if you haven't seen it already. So in the last episode, I talked about the influence of the Earth's electromagnetic field on our brain's neural net. And that's the broad picture, as there are many factors involved in the changes that occur within the Earth's field from one moment to the next. In this episode, I'm going to talk about gravity, in a kind of spiritual context, and then quite a bit about one planet in particular and its significance for your purpose. Firstly, everything in our solar system is electrically connected. This is important for astrology. Every planet, comet, moon, and asteroid, and both the Earth's field and the solar wind are affected by everything in the solar system. Space is not actually a vacuum, Though you may have been taught that it was as a child, as I was taught that too, but it's not true. Space is actually full of plasma, charged particles that are shot out into the solar system by the sun. There's a great juggling act going on throughout the entire cosmos where the electrical forces of negative and positive charges are being balanced everywhere. These charges are the essential yin and yang of life. This is the Tao. Traditional cosmology, still being taught today, has been a tad hung up on gravity and has missed the more obvious electrical solutions described by some fabulous mavericks of the astronomical field, including Hannes Alfein, Anthony Peratt, and more recently, physicist Wallace Thornhill and electrical engineer Don Scott. They have both been uh, reviving the extraordinary research work on the Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights, accomplished in the North Polar region by Christian Birkeland in the very early 20th century. Also, there are some wonderful ideas and discoveries by their associate, uh, Michael Claridge, who's one of my favourites in the field. I'll have more references and links on all this in the show notes for this particular episode, podcast.exceptionalpurpose.com. So apart from being electrically connected, changes in the magnetic field of each planet also produce radio waves, a particular type of frequency or a combination of frequencies. Radio waves, according to NASA, can be quite different from the size of a football to literally bigger than planets. That's just one waveform, so they're quite amazing. Radio waves are the longest waves we've encountered, but they have the least energy but they do travel incredible distances throughout space. Did you ever get to see the movie Contact with Jodie Foster? That's one of my favourite movies. They begin that movie with all the radio transmissions going out from the Earth out into space, and they are still going. Well, apparently, according to NASA, Marconi's first radio signal has passed by 1,000 stars already, and it's still going. Radio waves impact the resonance within the solar system, which ultimately affects the Earth's field. It's quite possible that these radio waves from the planets actually resonate with our own meridian system and our corresponding brain areas when they filter through the Earth's ionosphere. So through data sonification, these radio waves can be made audible for the limited range of our human hearing. And here's a sample of the sounds from Earth's field captured by NASA. Remember, these are not pressure waves that our ears normally hear. These are a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The brain actually feels this resonance, even though we don't normally consciously hear it. Did you notice, you know, the field around the Earth often sounds like a bird conference, while at other times it's reminiscent of whale song. 
Perhaps these beings are resonating with these frequencies in their own neural nets, reproducing them in an audible spectrum of sound for us. They may be creating the harmony with our world. After years of working with people and their astrology charts, I've developed my own intuitive way of imagining the shapes of these sine waves, their amplitudes, their frequencies, for each of the zodiac signs and their corresponding planets. Two extremes would be Taurus and Aquarius. Taurus, and I believe its corresponding body in the solar system being Vulcan, there is something out there, but that's a story in itself may be a slow-moving, low-amplitude wave with gently rounded peaks like low, undulating hills. It's a very peaceful wave. I see Aquarius and Uranus, by contrast, as a tall, narrow amplitude with a, a kind of a sharp peak and super-fast frequency. Uranus Aquarius is the fastest frequency we can experience among the entire range of astrological frequencies. It's the genius waveform. It really speeds things up. That's just to give you an idea. So getting back to purpose and exceptional purpose, there is one planet that has fascinated me for a long time. It's very strong in my own chart, of course, and resonates with my Capricorn ascendant, and that is Saturn. While I've been able to determine many resonances of planets with certain brain areas and functions, I don't see Saturn as being a physical resonance for us. Capricorn is a very misunderstood frequency. It's actually the gateway to the spiritual sector of the zodiac wheel of the chart, but not many people see it that way. When I've tried to imagine the waveform of Saturn, what I see is a flat line. There is no resonance. And Saturn has been associated astrologically with death and with those who work professionally in matters of death. Not exclusively, but it does apply. It's as though Saturn is stillness. This may be why Saturn has a reputation of blocking activity or holding us back in mysterious ways. But there is a trick to this. Saturn seems to have no wave at all, but how can this be? It has a beautiful hexagon formation at its own north pole which I think would be a resonance of the electromagnetic sound frequencies possibly from the ice rings around its equator, an echo resonance of some sort there. And this geometrical shape is also recognized in astrology as a sequence of sextiles being 60 degree angles. This is the aspect of half one potential, but that's another story. I'll also be talking about the elements in another episode and how I view those astrologically. But for now, I just want to say that I believe that the Saturn and Capricorn frequency is the earthiest of all the earth signs. They're not all the same. You know, in astrology we have, I'm sure you're aware of it, we have fire signs, earth signs, water signs and air signs. Yes, yeah, Saturn is definitely the earthiest of the earth signs. So what this means is that the Saturn frequency is one that offers us no assistance in our expression. It's therefore the initiation of the earth plane. Saturn is where we must make the changes in our life through the force of our own spirit, rather than being pushed or ignited to do something by an outside force, such as with Jupiter or Mars frequencies, etc. It's the place where we take the ultimate responsibility. It's been said in business circles that the greater amount of responsibility you're willing to take on in life is equivalent to the wealth and income you can generate. And this is also why Capricorn and Saturn have become traditionally known as the key indicators for success in the business world and in our careers. Relating also to the 10th house sector in your chart, the one that begins from the midheaven, literally the middle of the heavens above you. But astrologically that means the point that is the highest point the sun reaches that day. I'll explain the houses to you in a different time if you're not uh, familiar with them. So then I started to ponder Capricorn's frequency. Capricorn and Saturn have to have a frequency. And there are radio waves that have been recorded from Saturn. In fact, here's a snippet.
sounds a bit spooky, doesn't it? <laughs> so I began to wonder if perhaps Saturn and Capricorn may have a similar basic tonal frequency to the Earth. I mean, maybe it gets cancelled out by the Earth's own resonance. Saturn is the tool of our spirit, not our ego. That's why it's so easily projected out onto other people or institutions. You know, Saturn can be policemen or our teachers or our parents or our bosses at work, all that kind of stuff. So obviously, Saturn must play a significant role in our exceptional purpose, as it's also our fortitude and our resolve. Of course, we can have resolve to pass exams, increase our sales figures, lease the most expensive cars, but, but there's always a higher expression. Remember the knife example in the last episode? So here's the thing. The true perfection of Saturn is to bring in its polarity opposite, the moon. This creates the yin-yang balance. Why the moon, you may ask? They do seem very, very different, don't they? Well, the moon resonates with the Cancerian frequency. And if you look at the zodiac wheel, Cancer is opposite Capricorn. So they're polarity opposites. They're two halves of one whole energy. So the Cancerian emphasis is ultimately about nurturance, compassionate action, not just compassion, but compassion in action is what i found, and loving kindness. The moon in your chart is connected to your memories, your past, the subconscious mind. And when you tap into your own memories emotionally, you may feel more sympathy toward others who are going through the same scenarios or pain. This is not so much about mirror neurons, I think that's something else, as the drive to bring happiness to others, which is loving kindness. When this yin-yang polarity of Saturn and the moon is completed, we can live through our Saturn to become authorities in our chosen field. This is the linking of loving kindness and responsibility. It will be the companies and businesses that have a caring attitude toward their customers and a responsibility to the planet that will thrive in especially this current era. You just watch them. Have you noticed how everyone has been upping their customer service lately because we're living in the Pluto and Capricorn era? If you get my newsletter, you'll be able to download a, an article that I wrote about that years and years ago about this current era, this Pluto and Capricorn uh, paradigm. This is another reason why Saturn is so important for us right now. Saturn in your astrology chart can feel a lot like working out with weights. If you flop your arms around, you know, it will take a long time to develop any strength in them. But if you put heavy weights in your hands, lifting them rhythmically, they will provide the resistance from gravity which will build strong muscles in your arms. It's the same in yoga when you lift your own body weight in some asanas. So this means that Saturn is the resistance we feel simply by being in a physical body affected by gravity, by hunger, by cold and heat, and physical pain. We have to maintain our spiritual composure and our focus on ethical responsibility, on work that leads to a, a healthy structure of some sort for other human beings. This is the task with Saturn. And now we get to gravity. This is really interesting. Gravity is a very interesting phenomenon. And it would seem that gravity can be associated with the Saturn-Capricorn frequency. It's a force that closes in and contains energy. It doesn't disperse it. This is the opposite effect of Jupiter and Sagittarius. The planets Jupiter and Saturn are like two great valves in the solar system. Jupiter frees up energy and spins out the energy at a super pace, and Saturn says, too much, and closes it down again. So one is a check for the other. But think about gravity for a moment. What happens when you sleep, when you lose consciousness of the physical world around you? Your body is pressed down hard against the bed as close to the earth's centre as your bed and floor will allow. And then, what happens when you wake up? When you get out of bed and stand up, you are defying the entire gravitational field of the earth with purely the strength of your will. You have the same bones and muscles you had while you were sleeping, 
But through the force of your consciousness and your resolve, you were able to defeat gravity, well, to a certain degree. Perhaps then there may be some truth to the stories, you know, of yogis who levitate. Powerful consciousness may be able to do just that. I'm always fascinated by some things that crawl along the ceilings, you know. They just, they don't even notice gravity. <laughs> and of course, you can see what happens when you feel depressed, downhearted, literally. Your shoulders stoop, your posture changes, you slouch in chairs, your breathing becomes shallow. You can see the force of gravity pushing down on the body. It does this because your spiritual consciousness is being defeated by your brain's responses to environmental stimuli that echo unpleasant past life scenarios. Would you like me to say that again? I'll say it again. <laughs> it does this because your spiritual consciousness is being defeated by your brain's responses to environmental stimuli that echo unpleasant past life scenarios. Your Saturn has flatlined. So Saturn, as the resolve of our spirit, is pushing down on us all the time like a Zen master with a bamboo stick. We either use the Saturn frequency to become stronger or we project it onto others, which is a defeat. Saturn, as our spiritual initiator, is where we are on our own where we must find our fortitude and resolve. It's where we live by spiritual values, not egocentric ones. You see, it's the gateway to the spiritual sector of the zodiac. The last three signs. Saturn is an extremely important planet for people trying to live together on a single planet. Because without Saturn, we would have no ethics, no morality we wouldn't have the boundaries that we need in order to survive together. So it's really important that we develop these for ourselves. We can't all be masters of our human race, but we can develop our Saturn qualities within to become masters of ourselves. And we do that by developing routines and rituals that honor our spiritual core. Now rituals and habits are two entirely different things. A habit is something that we have inadvertently programmed into the limbic system of our brain, which resonates with the moon generally, or a more obsessive habit can resonate with Pluto. And it may even be damaging for our health or sanity, or worse, a habit may damage other beings. A habit is unconscious, so is usually more aligned with our ego focus on self. Now a ritual is quite different. A ritual is something we do deliberately and regularly over time to support our spiritual nature. So a ritual is an expression of our Saturn frequency. We all have Saturn somewhere in our birth chart, the sign it's in, the house area it's in, and also its geometric aspects to other planets and the asteroids, of course. And that's what gives you the clues to where you need to take responsibility in your life. As I'd illustrated in the last episode, we can use these astrological frequencies that are available to us at a variety of levels depending on our awareness. There are many people on this earth who don't live according to any sense of responsibility and these people cannot so far access the Saturn frequency they were born under. Saturn in this regard does not exist for them. It's a flat line. They have to find their own Saturn within and eventually life will force them to recognize their true essence. But it can sometimes take many lifetimes. And, you know, we've all been through that. We've all had those experiences in previous incarnations. It took us a while to get here. And this is one of the reasons why Saturn is also the frequency that relates to karma, which literally means action from the ancient Sanskrit language. Karma being the cause and effect mechanism in your life. Though it's a little more complex than that, as the effects we experience are directly related to how we manage our Saturn sense of responsibility. We'll get to more on that in another episode. So, perhaps for this week, you might like to contemplate your habits versus your rituals, and maybe even start a new daily practice in something developmental. It can be yoga, tai chi, aikido, playing the piano, meditating walking every day with an inspiring podcast, lighting a candle with spiritual intent, 
cooking your food with consciousness, whatever, and see if you can recognize where your Saturn frequency may be in your life. Where you sense you can become an authority figure for others through leading with compassion and loving kindness. Remember, where you place your resolve has a great deal to do with the results you experience in your life. Thank you for listening. If you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a rating and a review if you'd like at Apple Podcasts. And please consider subscribing. If you have questions you'd like me to answer in future episodes, you can leave me a voice message, which you might hear on the show, after downloading the Anchor FM podcast app, or go to my website, podcast.exceptionalpurpose.com. All the links are in the show notes there as well. And if you'd like to know more about me and my work, my main site is exceptionalpurpose.com. And while you're there, you can also download a couple of my resource guide e-booklets for business and also for authors, which is pretty much all of us now, when you subscribe to my newsletter. Have an exceptional week.